Hi, thank you everyone for joining us for Advanced Echo Education in Critical Care today. Um, we're going to go through a little bit about transesophageal echo and it's, I guess it's not a comprehensive lecture by any means, I've just got, I've got 45 minutes, so I've got a few cases to present, I'm going to try and show you tips and tricks. I think there are lots of things out there about how to perform a toe, everyone does it slightly differently. I'll show you how I do it and I'll give you little tips and tricks along the way and um, you know, the guys who are joining online, please interrupt me at any stage. You know, this is obviously uh, meant to be a bit didactic. Um, otherwise, I'll just sort of rabbit on and please, as I said, interrupt me if you've got a question. Um, I've got uh, a, a few lectures, a lecture here with a few little sort of bits of intro, um, in particularly just talking about the same as with transthoracic echo, transesophageal, try to be systematic. The the problems with I find with toe is that you don't have quite the same ability to go off axis as or the, the versatility, I guess, of transthoracic echo with transesophageal because you've only got sort of one line, if you like. But the, obviously the good thing is you can often get really nice image quality um, and, uh, and, and you can still assess this three-dimensional structure with a two-dimensional imaging tool. The second thing I guess to say is that the Doppler angle is not perfect with transesophageal echo, which is sometimes uh, you know a bit frustrating. But again, I'll try and show you how you can maximise that to the best of your ability. Uh, and um, so we'll go from there. All right. So first things first, how to stick the probe down. Um, I'm presuming everyone's got a little bit of knowledge of uh, of how to do transesophageal echo. You know, obviously we've got the the, the big wheel that moves and the anti-flexes and retroflexes the probe. You've got the smaller wheel that moves uh, moves the probe from one side to the other. You've got your buttons, which are called, we call the omniplane, uh, which rotate the field of view. And again, I'll show that on Bob on the Echo Simulator. Um, but first things first, let's talk about how to stick the thing in in a nice, safe manner. So if you've got a patient who's intubated, obviously you're not going to be able to ask them to swallow, which sometimes helps direct the probe in the right area. Uh, but the, the philosophies, I guess, still the same about when you're, how you're putting down the probe. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna, you need to find out which way the, sort of the ultrasound wave is coming out, and that's here on Bob at the moment. And when I'm putting that probe in, if I've got my anti-flexion and uh, retroflexion and anti-flexion there, what I try and do is as I put the probe in, I'm going to do a little bit of retroflexion to go along the hard palate. And if you imagine then as I'm trying to get around the tongue, the back of the tongue, I use a bit of anti-flexion to help lead it down in the right way. And then at the last minute, I'm going to go back to retroflexion just to try and lead it down the esophagus. So just in summary, therefore, I start off with some retroflexion over the hard palate, anti-flexion to get it around the back of the tongue, which will sort of take me to there. And then I do retroflexion to make sure that I don't go down the uh, trachea. Okay, uh, a little bit hard to show you how to do that in Bob, but um, hopefully you get the idea. All right, so let's just start off with, uh, we'll start off moving over onto Bob. So here we can see I'm going to sort of put the toe probe down. I might just try and take away some of the anatomy. Obviously a little hard to do this on a real patient. Uh, so let's do Heidel, let's have some bones, let's have a heart. She wanted me just have a heart. Um, and let's make the ultrasound nice and easy so we don't have anything in the way. Okay. So I guess first things first, you'll notice that we've got First things first, notice that the red line here is on the, on the patient's left. Yeah, so there's our patient. We are sitting, we're imaging from behind the heart, looking forwards, all right? The way I sometimes imagine that, if you're using your right hand, your thumb is the equivalent of this little nubbin up here where it says CAE, right? That's your thumb. So your thumb is on the left side of the image, so that's the red line there. And you've got to imagine you're standing at the head looking down towards the feet. And as you're doing that, you put your hand into the probe. So if you're looking, again, looking, I'm standing at the head of the patient looking down towards the feet. That means that the, my thumb is on that left side of the image. That's what looks towards the LV. All right? 
And so as I come down and sort of push this in, you'll see that the left ventricle is sitting here on the left side of the screen. There's the LV and there's the RV on the right. Okay, so I'll just take away here, I'm going to take away the bones and so you can see that that red line is on the left side of the patient. Okay. The next thing I want you to see is as I pull the probe up and down in the esophagus, that obviously changes this line of interrogation we've got in this sort of craniocaudal direction. Okay, so now looking at the image on the right, as I pull it up, you know, there we can see the pulmonary artery. Sort of see me cutting through this structure in there, the pulmonary artery. Yep. And therefore, as I then push the probe further down, I start dissecting that heart at the various levels. Okay? The next thing we need to notice, as I, I've stopped here quite deliberately at what's known as the, the mid-esophageal view, because as I start to get to this level here, watch what happens to my probe. I'm sorry it doesn't have the whole thing up at the top there. But as I start to push that probe in, look at the line of interrogation. It sort of ends up moving a little bit more, um, oops, it sort of starts moving a little bit more in the cross section, so that the angle has changed from being, here we go, so the angle has changed from being sort of, uh, up and down into that perfect, that perfect plane up, up there in truss, cross section. And then the probe curves around underneath. And this is where the esophagus, it curls underneath that heart so that when we're getting down to the gastric views, we're more in a cross sectional view. So the heart isn't a perfect cylinder in other, ways, in other words and neither is the esophagus. Okay? So when you want to get your cross section, which is a really nice place to sort of start in my opinion, you just got to keep it at zero degrees. Here's our zero degrees up at the top. Don't know if my little picture's in the way there. But here we go, zero degrees up at the top here. And that's where the omniplane is, so short axis. So that's the first thing to know. All right, I'm just going to do one last demonstration before we start moving into some good stuff. Okay, so let's go to our mid-esophageal four-chamber view again. So we'll come back and talk a little bit more of this in a moment. So I don't normally start at this view, but here we go with our right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. I'll just talk about the omniplane now. And some of these are probe movements. So same as with transthoracic echo, do one movement at a time, otherwise you get lost. And I think it's particularly true when you're starting off using toe for the first time, is it's pretty easy to get confused and lost and try and figure out which movement does which thing. Um, so just try and do one movement at a time. So the, the movements that we have, as I showed you, obviously we can pull the probe in and out, which goes up and down through the heart, all right? Or you can keep it in the same position and I can twist it from one side to the other, okay? And I'm doing that by grabbing my hand and literally rocking the probe, okay? That's how we twist it. I'm not using my left hand twisting here. I'm using my right hand on the probe. Okay, and so this is going to be the next sort of tip and trick. This is a little bit like doing a bronc, right? When you're doing, um, I can't remember if you told me how to do a bronc, but they always said you've got to keep your hands far apart with a bronc and you twist with the handle. And you've got to keep your hands far apart because if you have your hands close together, it's almost like the, um, the string is, is right next door to each other in a big loop. And then when you twist it, you don't have the same sort of torque going around to the other side. I don't know if I've explained that very well, but what I mean is if I've got my hands close together and I do the twisting movement, look how much of a twist I get on my, on my picture. It's not a huge amount, right, as I'm going from one way to the other. As opposed to if my hands are nicely separated apart from each other, when I twist my hands, I get this much finer control of that in-plane movement, if you like. All right? So that's the side-to-side -side movement, the in-plane movement, the fishtailing, the tilting, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. But that in-plane motion is just rotating your hand that's holding the handle from one side and the other. Okay, so that's moving in and out side to side. The next ones we've got is using the omniplane. So again, if I just can move my image of myself just so we can see the omniplane thing. If I've got a nice four-chamber view, classically just a little bit of retroflexion, 
what I'm now going to do is move the little buttons that are on the handle. And if I come up to 60 degrees, you can see it's almost like looking in a sort of two-chamber direction. Just move this a little bit more. All right, so I'll go back down to zero. So then as I come up, the whole thing, the whole sort of omniplane or whole angle of interrogation, the whole, I don't know what you call it, plane of interrogation, if I put that left ventricle in the middle of my screen, I then start rotating around up to 60 degrees, I get what looks like a uh, two-chamber view. I often then come up to 90, come, so that's the commissural view, a two-chamber view is, I guess, 90 degrees. Here we go. I can come around to 120 for the three-chamber mid-esophageal view. And then if you go around 180 degrees, that's sort of moved all the way around. And when I'm thinking about doing this in a real patient, again, I imagine I'm standing at the head of the bed. My arm is the toe probe. My hand is this angle of interrogation that you can see on your screen on the left. And your thumb, therefore, is on the patient's left. And then if you're down, the, if you're down into that esophagus, as you rotate round, your hand is moving from being pronated to supinated. It's a little hard to try and do that. It may, maybe talking about that is a bit easier when you're in person, but give it a go. It makes sense to me. I don't think it makes sense to everyone. Uh, all right. So that's the last thing. I guess the last movement that we've got. So we can go in and out. We can go side to side with rotation. We can move the omniplane. So those are the big movements. The last one is just moving it from left to right. You can see it sort of tilts. The whole angle of interrogation just sort of slides from one side to the other. And that's with the outdoor wheel. And it's not something I use a hell of a lot, to be honest. But I'll show you where I do use it, which is in one of the deep gastric views. And that's about it. Um, I guess the last thing to say is, which is not on the simulators, but on every single toe probe you'll use clinically, the last button to discuss is what's called the lock button. I think these are probably most used by anaesthetists intraoperatively so that you can lock the toe in a position and just leave it there and then you can turn it off and turn it on again when the surgeon's ready. I think that's fine if you want to do that. But in ICU, I, I think they shouldn't sell them to us with the ICU. The, the problem is, right, these locks just, for example, if you do full retroflexion, you lock it there. If you were then to move that probe in the esophagus, it could cause a hole. Uh, you know, could tear a hole in the esophagus. And that's the thing that scares me most is, is with these procedures, is damaging the esophagus. That is obviously a life-threatening thing. It is luckily incredibly rare and only happens, you know, one in five to 10,000, I think, is the literature. Um, so just, yeah, if you've got the lock, you just got to make sure before you do anything else that it is off. And so the lock is always, when it's flat with the probe, that's when it's off. So don't start anything with it up, okay? So maybe that's a good tip and trick is just have a good look at your equipment before you start sticking it in and just make sure you're doing it under supervision the first few times you're doing it. Okay. Uh, all right, let's start with one of the tricky, the tricky views. Um, so as we start advancing the probe, we're going to try and go down from our mid-esophageal. We're going to move over into our sort of upper gastric, if you like, down into the deep gastric which is where you start going past the uh, start going past the tip of the left ventricle. All right. So here I've described this as an upper gastric view when you've got that heart in short axis. Really great view for looking at anything from LV size, function, regional wall motion abnormalities, RV dilation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's um, really really useful view to sort of to be starting with, and I'll come back to that in a second. The, the one that's I think is tricky, which I think the tip and trick is often needed, is putting your probe to get the deep gastric view. So that Bob's not great at this, but you'll get the idea. If I carry on pushing my probe in, you get and I do some anti-flexion, you can start getting a view back up towards the heart. And I said Bob's not great with it because with a bit of anti-flexion that I can't really do here, and I don't want to break Bob; he's pretty expensive. You get a view back up towards the aortic valve, okay? So, as you'll see here, if I were to, yeah, it doesn't quite do it, almost I get it. As you're starting to have a look back up towards the heart, that can give you an angle of interrogation. I don't want to break him. 
of angle of interrogation back up in towards the aortic valve. I'm going to show you all the other views that you can look at the aortic valve, and the long and short is they're all pretty rubbish. If you want to get it, you've got to do it with the deep transgastric view, and I'll show you how to do that on this one over here. Okay, so... Okay, so the view that we're after is this one here, and it doesn't come out very well, but you've got this view sort of back up towards the aortic valve, and here you can see it's almost like we're looking at a five-chamber view. So you've got this, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, no, you probably can't, um, but you've got this view up through the left ventricle, through the LVOT and the aortic valve. And I'll try and show you the angle, therefore, is actually pretty good to try and get flows through the aortic valve. So that's why I think it's important to learn how to do the deep gastric view. The way that we do this, and I've, this is a real patient that um, I recorded the images from. So if I'm at zero degrees, you'll see me up there in the top sort of right. I wonder if I can just try and show you this. Can you see that? There we go, nice. Okay, so here I've got zero degrees, and what I've got is, is a bit of a dodgy one sometimes, but here I've got the short axis view in sort of the upper gastric view. And what I'm going to do to try and get the deep gastric view is I advance the probe until I lose the image completely of the, uh, of the apex of the left ventricle. I'm then going to do full anti-flexion, and I still don't want to see any view of the heart. Because what my worry is, is if you start doing anti-flexion too soon, is that you could be in sort of that lower part of the esophagus, and you do not want to do full anti-flexion when you're in the lower esophagus. You can do it when you're in the gas, when you can do it when you're in the stomach, but you can't do it when you're in the esophagus. And so that's why this movement, first of all, is making sure I go way past the end of the heart. I'll then do full anti-flexion. And then I pull back the probe very slowly until I get contact again between the probe and the sort of side of the stomach where the heart is contracting against. And you'll have a look what this looks like just in the uh, ultrasound image, all right? So as I press play, I can see that I've now lost the uh, end of that LV. I'm now doing full anti-flexion. I can't see the heart. And now I'm gently pulling back, gently pulling back, gently pulling back. And finally, that heart is coming into view, and we start to get an idea. You could just sort of see the aortic valve coming into view um, uh, just at the end there. And I'll just show you one last time. Okay, so there I am in the upper gastric view. I'm going to push, 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 go forwards, forwards, forwards. I can't see anything. I'm just getting weird, dirty shadow. I'm in the stomach. I do full anti-flexion. I can't see anything. And then I pull back slowly until that heart, until I've got this kind of pattern that comes in. And it's not perfect, and the deep gastric very rarely is. But you get an idea that the left ventricle is here, the right ventricle is here, and I'm seeing the aortic valve come into play there. All right? You can just sort of see it starting to flap around in there. I don't know if I can pull it back to that bit there. Okay, pulling it again. There's the aortic valve, and that's where you want to then stick your... That's when you can then stick your continuous wave Doppler down through that deep gastric view. And you can use your continuous wave Doppler, or you can use your pulse wave Doppler. Okay? And this is probably the best angle for just like a five-chamber view for trying to have a look at flows through the aortic, level, uh, aortic valve. Okay? Um, just while I'm on that, if you're going to do Doppler traces, to show you an example of a good Doppler trace and a bad Doppler trace, so the good Doppler trace is where you've got maybe three cardiac cycles within your frame. You've got the baseline at the top of the screen, and you've got the scale reduced, so what you're interested in is filling the screen. I'm going to reduce the gain, so we're looking at the modal velocity, so that's where the majority of blood is flowing. I'm not, I'm not too interested in that chaotic or excessive chaotic motion of the, of the blood. That's the fuzz, right? We call it the fuzz or the beard that's around these Doppler profiles. I'm not interested in that. I want to see, uh, I want to see the modal velocity where, the, where it's the, the image is brightest. And here in my pulse wave image when I'm through the LVOT, if I'm in there, I, I want to see a closing click. But you can see I've got quite a clear outline. There's not a lot of fuzz or beard to this trace. And then when you're tracing it, uh, try and make it as accurate as possible. And again, my tip and trick for doing that is don't, when I, if I was to click there and then start trying to trace out the line, don't look at the position. So I don't look, if I'm starting here, I don't look at that point. If I've clicked there, I look 
about two, cent two or three centimeters ahead of where I'm going. So I look at that point there, and your and your and your head, head just automatically follows where you're going. It's a bit like I use the expression. Um, it's like when you're surfing and doing a turn, or in your car doing a turn. You um, you don't look at the end of your bonnet, or you don't look at the end of your board when you're doing a turn. You look three or four meters ahead, and your your body just naturally follows the line. All right. Uh, let's go back to Bob. Okay. So systematic approach. Let's talk about the images. So I normally start with this deep gastric view. I start with trying to get my view back up towards the heart. Uh, this guy, Bob's not doing that very well today. Um, it's probably because I broke the other toe probe trying to do it so often, and that's why we've got a new toe probe, and that's why it doesn't work very well, because I haven't broken it yet. So I will try not to do that. OK, so um, standard views. OK, so after that deep gastric view that I showed you on, that, on those slides, next one is trying to have a look up through this sort of bottom part, the short axis of the heart. And so I'm trying to look from the very tip to the mid-esophageal level where I've got my anterolateral. Again, I'm imaging from posterior, so that's the posteromedial anterolateral papillary muscles. So that means that in here is the inferior wall, that's the anterior wall. Infraceptal, anteroceptal, infralateral, anterolateral. Okay? It's all at zero degrees, and I can pull up trying to see the basal level. If we're looking at the, I probably need to just change my angle just a little bit. Beautiful. Uh, and you get the larger anterior leaflet and the smaller posterior leaflet, and you get an idea of that fish mouth opening for the mitral valve. Okay? So that's all at zero degrees. And so I take an image of both of those. I then go back to my, I then sort of start at my uh, mid papillary level and keeping what I'm interested in in the middle of the screen, so I'm concentrating the LV, I'll then come up to 90 degrees. Okay, and when I'm sitting here at so 90 degrees, I've got the wall that's closest to me is going to be the inferior wall, because I'm imaging from the esophagus, right? And over here is going to be the anterior wall. And you, hopefully I can persuade that by looking at Bob here, you can see the, uh, if I put the bones back on, you can sort of see where I'm imaging in there. Yeah, so um, my probe sitting posteriorly, I'm imaging towards the front, so inferior wall is over here, anterior wall is further away. I do think Bob is pretty amazing in terms of showing this. Awesome. Okay. After that view, the next, so the, the next bite of the cherry you can get at looking at the aortic valve is going to 120 degrees. And I'm going to try and image in here where the aortic valve is. So that means I need to look to the patient's left. If I'm looking to the patient's left, I don't know how well I'm going to show you that. That means I need to tilt need to twist my probe over to his left, all right? And just try and find a view that looks like that. Okay, so again, the heart is sitting on its side here. You know, the angle is sort of, it's almost on its side. And that means that I can put my Doppler profile through here. And what you're clearly going to see is that's a bit of a rubbish Doppler angle, right? I mean, we are maybe 60 degrees out at least which means that we are going to be vastly underestimating the flows through that valve. But we can get it, and it's, you know, we don't have a lot of choice. And so you, can get, you do get your Doppler profiles, they're just a bit rubbish. So, but that's often all we've got, so we'll do what we can. Okay, the other views that we can do in, the, uh, in this view here, and I'll try and show you one of my faves, is a, a, a bit of a special one is if you look over towards the right ventricle. Obviously, I think it's special because it's about the right ventricle. But if you can look over to the patient's right, so you see what I do with my hand then? I Again, I'm going to turn Bob around. So I'm now looking from the back. If I want to look to the patient's right, I need to look in this direction over here. I'm trying to look over to the, to the right side of the patient there. So the movement that I've got to do with my hand is I've therefore got to sort of roll my hand over so that everything twists around to his right. Okay. 
And again, Bob's not great for this view. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't even think I've got a. If you can then do a little bit of, it's not going to come out, come out very well. If you could do a little bit of anti-flexion, so that means a little bit of a pull down with my thumb, and I go rotate in the opposite direction with the outside probe, you can get this sort of inflow view of your right ventricle. So I've basically got my two hands. My thumb is on the big wheel closest to the the to the uh, to the handle, and I pull that towards one way. And then with my other finger on the outside angle, I pull, so pulling the two, uh, to the two wheels in opposite directions, all right? And the view that I'm trying to get is this, all right? So I'm sort of at the mid-esophageal view, uh, excuse me, the, looking at the mid-papillary muscles in my zero degrees, short axis in the uh, sort of gastric view. I go anti-flexion, I go lateral movement, the other way, and I'm trying to get that view there, where I have to hold my probe here. So I've got my right atrium at the top. I've got my tricuspid valve there. So sometimes I can get a good look at tricuspid regurge, but also the bit that I love is you're sitting down here as you start to get that pulmonary valve in. And I don't think Bob's going to let me do it, but it's worth a shot. You can then have a view. Yeah, Bob won't let me give me a view view, but you can, you can imagine that I can start having a look at the RVOT profile. And there aren't many views in the, you know, with toe that you can start having a look at that RVOT profile. So looking at pulmonary acceleration time, that flying W sign and things like that. So that's just a, you know, a semi-useful view that I, I sometimes do. All right, so I showed you all those views in that gastric area. If we then start to pull back, Whoa. Okay. As we then start to pull back, you're going to see the angle suddenly, as, I, as my toe probe sort of moves around the back of the heart, it suddenly moves up into a more vertical orientation. And that means that the angle of interrogation flips down, as you saw there. And that's how we can then start looking at our mid esophageal four chamber view. And what we've often got to do is just do a little bit of retroflexion. You see how here I'm dissecting, I'm not going through the true apex yet. And if you have a look at my image, I'm here, I've got the coronary sinus coming into the right atrium. That tells me I've got to pull up just a little bit and I can start to see the atria then. If I carry on pulling up, I'll start seeing the aortic valve come in. So you want to be somewhere before you start seeing the aortic valve in and before you start seeing the coronary sinus, that's where you need to be for the mid esophageal view. But what you can see as well is that I'm nowhere near that angle that I want to be, which is down through the apex of the heart. That heart looks quite globular, it looks like a soccer ball. And you want the heart to look like a rugby ball. So I'm going to ask you, what movement do you have to do to try and make this image look more like an almond or the rugby ball shape? And the view that you want to do is you want to bit of retroflexion. And with that retroflexion, you can make that heart look more like a rugby ball. It looks more almond in shape, right? So that's where it sits normally. I want to do a little bit of retroflexion and hopefully we start getting a nice view of your mid-esophageal four chamber. Okay? And with that, we've got our left atrium and right atrium. So the atria at the top, because they sit at the back of the heart, closer to the esophagus. And then further away from you, Here's our left ventricle and right ventricle. Okay, so that's probably the, the nice start to it. How about I show you a quick case? All right, so here's case one. Uh, urgent phone call into a neurosurgical procedure. Uh, they were doing a resection of this recurrent tumor and we were called into because of unfortunately this guy was hypotensive and they lost output. And I don't want to bag up my colleagues too much, uh, but the, you know, you walk into this scene where they ask for an urgent intraoperative toe to help guide management. And you walk in there and there's a fairly sheepish looking uh, surgeon sitting at one end who's kind of got his hands uh, covering this sort of blood soaked gown and blood all over his hands. And there's sort of, there's some blood on the floor and there's some blood on the sheets. And then there are a lot of uh, anaesthetists around obviously trying to figure out what's going on sort of reminds me of the idea that 
you know, toe does not, or ultrasound does not replace clinical management, because obviously the first thought when you come in and you see this is, well, this guy's got to be hypovolemic, right? He, he, we've got blood everywhere, and a guy who's having an elective procedure uh, for a section of t a tumor, you know, it's likely if there's a hypotension component to this, other things can be at play, but obviously the first thing you've got to be thinking if you've got blood everywhere is that there's hypovolemic shock, right? So this is what toe pictures look like of hypovolemic shock. And here at zero degrees in our gastric view, you can see there is obliteration of that end systolic cavity. I apologize, excuse me. Oh, it's just my computer that's frozen. You get obliteration of that end systolic cavity and that hyperdynamic function. When I then move from zero degrees to 90 degrees, this is meant to be that gastric view where I've just literally gone from that previous view, just turn around 90 degrees, so you're looking through that heart. You can see this is the axis is sort of lengthways across the screen. And again, we can't see the inside of the left ventricle. It'd be really important for me then to want to fan one way or another. Maybe I can just quickly just show that actually. Just hang on a sec. So if I'm in... Oh, have I? Oh, nice. So if I was in that short axis there, what I was showing to you before, if I then go up to 90 degrees, that's the view that I was showing you in that image. And one of the things I maybe didn't show you, because if I was worried, if I couldn't see the inside of the heart, I can maybe make this guy look like he's got cavity obstruction if I go to one side. If I now rotate my hand, I don't know if you can see my hand, but I'm just now fanning from one side to the other, and you can see, I need to make sure that you, you want to take the image when you're right at the apex, when you've made that heart look as open up as possible. You know, making sure that, that they are as open up as possible and that that heart is as long as possible. And that's when you know you're in the right space. So you want to be able to look from one side to the other. So that was really important for me when I was doing that toe on that case, is to make sure that I was... Um... Oh, he hates me. I might just see if I can come back a bit. Sorry, guys. Yeah? So as I just sort of fan through that structure, but you can see the left atrium, there's just no left ventricle in there at all, which means it's small and hyperdynamic, which suggests kissing ventricle sign that significantly hy significant hypovolemia. Okay? And then the last one I show you is up in the mid-esophageal view. Again, look how small and nubbin-like this cavity looks. And the last thing I was looking for was systolic anterior motion. You know, did, was there any obstruction happening at that level of... I don't think my computer likes that very much. But you get the idea. Um, so maybe in systole, a little bit of obstruction happening there, but I couldn't demonstrate that on Doppler. All right, so uh, what do we talk about next? Um, mid esophageal I guess to talk a little bit about the mitral valve. So if I've got my four chamber view, okay, so once I do a little bit of retroflexion, I've got a nice view there. Have a look at all abnormalities you can whilst you're there. But the next thing I try and do is go and look through the left ventricle and particularly try and look at all the different types of mitral valve leaflet abnormalities there are. And so here we've got the longer anterior mitral valve leaflet that sticks next door to the uh, stick next door to the septum, and there's a smaller posterior leaflet, and we can have a look through all of that. Maybe just in the meaning of time, I might leave that for a different talk because we're just sort of doing the intro stuff here. Commissural view, maybe P1, A2, P3, something that looks like that, and then carry on going up to. 90 degrees, and the bigger anterior leaflet now is at the front. You can see with the, uh, here's the red one, so the anterior is at the front, A2 and P2 probably, and then up to 120 degrees as we carry on rotating around A2, maybe P3. And there's our aortic valve, left ventricle, mitral valve sitting in there. All right, so just fanning all the way around. Now, if I 
the, the next thing we want to try and do at this level is have a look at our left atrial appendage. And one of the things I find that trainees can sometimes get wrong with this is you've got to come down to 110 degrees. It's classically where it is. And one of the things I want to try and ask you guys to have a look at is look at the size of the left atrial appendage. And I don't know if you got to see the, the dissection we did a couple of weeks ago. I mean, it's, it's literally about maybe two, three centimeters long. And that means that you've got this three-dimensional structure. I, just, I, I think that a one-off view through the left atrial appendage to exclude a clot in someone who's got atrial fibrillation, for example, is not enough. You've got to fan through that whole structure. And so what I mean by that is that when you're at 100 degrees after you've got at that aortic, you know, I've come down from 120 to 110 degrees. I can still see my aortic valve, but I now want to have a look to that patient's left side to have a look at my left atrial appendage that's just in there. Okay, it's just in there. So that means that I rotate my hand over to the left side. Can you see what I've done there? So I've rotated over to the patient's left to now have a look at this structure here, which is the left atrial appendage. And that's right in here. I'd want to put color over it. Zoom in on it and turn the scale down. So the scale looking for low flow states, so the scale's got to be low. And I'll look at it in one plane and I'll try and fan all the way through it. So look what I'm doing with my hand. I'm rotating my hand. I'm not rotating my left hand. I could even just do it with my right hand, but I've got to keep, I've got to keep it in the same, same spot with my left. So I just rotate from one way to the other, all right? And just changing that scale, looking for low flow speed states. And once we're in that little area there, I can then look with my pulse wave Doppler, and I can look in there, and Bob doesn't like me doing this, but you can look in there to look for then the flows coming through that area, looking for low flow states, all right? Just while we're here, I'll just quickly show you another view. So I'll often, if I'm looking at the left atrial appendage, I'll also come down to maybe 70 degrees and try and have a look at it in sort of two different planes. And you can just sort of see it coming through here. If you look in there, look through one and look through the other. All right, next thing, pulmonary veins. There are four pulmonary veins. Left upper, right upper, right lower, left lower. The left upper is probably the easiest to find, so you're sticking at about 110 degrees. And Bob doesn't, the angles are not perfect in Bob, okay? So we'll start again where we, where we were before with the aortic valve, mid-esophageal view. I'm then going to rotate my hand, looking towards the patient's left. Okay, until that aortic valve comes in. And what's sitting just above it in there is the left upper pulmonary vein. Okay, up in there. And again, I say Bob isn't great for this. I will then try and sort of change my angle of interrogation, trying to make this look as long as possible. All right, so I'm trying to get myself through that little area just there. And that's where we can put our pulse wave Doppler down through that. Again, trying to get low flow states, trying to get your look at your pulmonary vein flows. If you reduce your angle even more, I typically look at changing it by about 40 to 60. You get the next look at the left lower pulmonary vein. All right? So I find the left atrial appendage first. I look above it, change my angle till I get the left upper pulmonary vein. And then I change it by about 40 degree angle in the same kind of area and try and get the next, uh, the next, um, I guess, worm of flow uh, that comes out. I often find you can't get decent 2D images. What I tend to do to look for my pulmonary veins is I actually just put color Doppler. Color Doppler over like that with a reduced scale.
and I'll typically have it down by about to about 30. Okay, and then I just look for the color flow states in here. All right, sort of running out of time a bit here. Uh, all right, after that, so after I've looked at those primary veins, I come to 30 degrees and I start pulling my probe back a little bit. Pulling that probe back a little bit and you can see that the aortic valve starts to come in. Okay, 30 degrees is normally about what I see in patients. Bob's a bit more like 60. And we're looking for this. Oh, messing it up a bit. Sorry, doing two things at once is not my forte. Ah, oh, you get the idea. So the inserting in here is the aortic valve there, and you should see the three leaflet cusps opening. You've got the left atrium at the top, interatrial septum, right atrium, and there's the tricuspid valve that comes in there and sort of wraps around. As I said, Bob's sometimes not magic for his short axis views, but I hope you sort of get the point. Okay, that's a good way to have a look at the aortic valve. And you can look at that both at about 30 degrees and you can also come up to try and get it in cross-sectional air, uh, try and get it into longitudinal format to have a look at the aortic valve in two separate areas. So the aortic valve, as I was saying, is it's not always super straightforward. I'll just show you this case if I can. Um, so uh, this is a case, actually I'm going to skip this one. Might come back to that one. So this is a 63-year-old lady who was sent in from the GP for chest pain and shortness of breath. Uh, started to have a hypotensive and bradycardic episode and was, came to us at a short run of VT um, and required intubation. Uh, and obviously we were concerned about her heart, so we did a transthoracic that didn't work very well, so we moved on to a transesophageal. And one of the first things we saw in this sort of deep gastric view, so you can see at zero degrees, I don't know if you can just see the suggestion of the aortic valve in there, is we've got this suggestion that we've got this high flow coming through that aortic valve. I'm not suggesting it's perfect, but you get the idea that it's, there's something very wrong with that flow. We can put our Doppler profile in there, suggesting that we've got a bit of a raised VTI. Uh, again, normal VTI around about 22. And, but suggesting that there's, there's no major obstruction sort of at that area, but maybe the, there was something wrong with the aortic valve, okay? I come up to 120 degrees in that uh, sort of lower, um, lower esophageal or sort of upper gastric area. And again, we're getting this very high gradient that comes out. And you can immediately see that it's under four. It was over four before. And that's because of the angle of interrogation is a bit rubbish. And that's just toe, unfortunately. We can have a look at our LV. This is an LV that is not working perfectly. This is at least moderate dysfunction. Similar kind of way to assess it as you would the transthoracic, but again, inferior wall at the back, anterior at the front, septum there, lateral wall there. And then up here at about you know 120 degrees, plus or minus 20 degrees, in this upper esophageal area, and suddenly start to get this idea of this, we've got variance on here, the green bit, scale is rubbish, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, but we've got this heavily calcified, you can see these acoustic shadows that come all the way to the back, sort of blocking out the view. So these acoustic shadows from a highly calcified aortic valve with then a very, looks like a very small aperture in there, it's even up there, with a highly chaotic blood flow coming out, suggesting aortic stenosis. And then if we go and have a look at that in short axis, short axis, this gives you an idea of what at about 30 degrees, we've got three cusps, non-coronary cusp next door to the interatrial septum, right coronary cusp sitting next door to the right ventricle, and left coronary cusp sitting towards the left atrium, so the left ventricle would be in there. And I'm sure the observant ones of you have spotted that she's also got a pacing wire in place now for the bradycardia. But this 
is an example of someone with a very stenotic, highly calcified, poorly opening aortic valve. We can do this measure, the aortic valve planimetry. It's not something I'm a big fan of, but I guess it gives you an indication. It does not get any way in the way of other forms of quantification. But even with this, you, you can try and use toe maybe more accurately than transthoracic, trying to make sure that you're right at the tips of where that aortic valve opens. Um, and you know, you're right there at the tips uh, where the actual sort of closest aperture is that you're trying to measure. And it's not perfect, but uh, it gives you an idea. And it's better with toe than uh, transthoracic. Uh, yeah, more of the same. You know, toe getting this level of detail that's just marvelous, showing that there's this nasty regurgitation that's coming on with this, eccentric in nature. Likely we wouldn't get this kind of detail with transthoracic and just helps tell us that we've got this very markedly abnormal looking regurgitation that's in there. Okay, a um, few minutes left. Uh, what's Yeah, I mean, maybe just maybe just a really quick one at talking about. So after you've had a look at that aortic valve, I will. Where's the heart gone? Right, there we go. So after I've looked at that aortic valve, I'll often come up to 110 degrees and start to have a look at the IV. Uh, start to have a look at the SVC. Okay, so this is the right atrium here. You can see just on the, the left side of the screen that purple one there. That is the right atrium, and coming into that right atrium. We've got our SVC that drains into the top, and you've got your IVC at the bottom. Okay, it's normally about 110 degrees. It's about 90 in Bob. And so you get something that looks a little bit like this. So here you've got the right atrium, and here you've got the SVC coming in there. And if I push that probe in, you get the IVC that comes in the bottom there. If you keep pushing, you can sometimes get an idea of the, where the hepatic veins are. Now, Bob, normally you see the left atrium at the top, and this is quite a good view for doing a bubble study, looking for patent for amen ovales or ASDs. Uh, again, maybe we'll talk about that at a different time. What I want to get your suggestion is, is looking through here with M mode. So if you reduce your depth and you put M mode through here, you can get an idea of how the collapsibility of the SVC, which is, from a research perspective, suggested to be the most or the, the one that has the highest sensitivity and specificity for ruling out whether someone's going to be fluid responsive, if you believe in that kind of thing. So that means if someone is in shock and that you want to increase up their cardiac output, you, this is one of the best ways of assessing if that will happen. So if you have, doing this view, 110 degrees, SVC, so that's the upper esophageal view, looking towards the patient's right, using M mode through the SVC, and you look to see if that collapsibility is greater than 36%. They need to be on at least 8 mils per kilogram tidal volume, fully mandatory, mechanically ventilated patients. If you've got all of those together, they've got to be in sinus rhythm, so that's the other thing. If you've got all of that together and you see that collapsibility of 36, then that would suggest that they are be fluid responsive. And by that I mean that if you give, you, if you give fluid, you will increase up their stroke volume. Uh, the next question, of course, is, is what happens a few hours later because there's also some pretty good evidence to suggest that you'll be back in exactly the same point that you were when you started, when you give the fluid. But again, that's probably a conversation for another time. Um, I'm not suggesting fluids are bad. <laughs> I'm just saying judicious fluids are the right time and you know, fluid responsiveness is a tricky thing to talk about. Um, all right, last, very last bit, uh, aorta. Um, so once you're back down, So once you've got back from your SVC, you can find the aorta. So that's going to be the big structure that comes up off the, um, off the aorta, uh, the aortic valve. If I come around to 120 degrees, I can get an idea of the ascending aorta. If I want to look at more of it, I pull the probe out because that's what helps me look. You know, I'm trying to look at this structure here. So if I'm down in there at the aortic valve level, you know, there's the aorta, uh, the aortic valve. If I want to look further up, I've got to lift the probe out of the 
uh, out of the stomach. And you can have a look at the ascending aorta. And then normally come down to zero. I turn my probe to the patient's left. So instead of looking at the aortic valve there, if I then look at that patient's, if I then look at that patient's left side, I can then look at that descending aorta. And you can do that at zero degrees or at 90-ish. Okay? And you can then follow that all the way down. Maybe just in the last moment, I'll just show you uh, where that was useful for us. So we had an 84-year-old man. He collapsed at home. He was dizzy, complained of neck pain, low GCS. We arrived in ED, and he was short of breath, horribly hypertensive, distended neck veins. We were called because they'd done a fast scan. It suggested he had a pericardial effusion. And he's on the background of having some nasty cancer. And he was transferred to ICU with a barely palpable pulse. But the interesting thing was this collapse at home, and that's a bit of a weird presentation just for tamponade. We did a focus study, and we absolutely found this really small pericardial effusion, but there was this definite evidence of right atrial collapse in the sub, uh, subcostal view, and in the apical view, there's a definite area of fluid. Apical approach felt pretty good to us because that's where he had the biggest gap. And so you can see the subcostal, it didn't have a great gap, so we, we did an apical approach aiming towards the right ventricle and we drained the effusion. And the big point was though, this collapse, you know, what the heck was causing him to have the collapse? Was it just the, just the tamponade or was there something else going on? And if it was the tamponade, it's very small and very acute. And, and I think appropriately along with the chest pain, you know, chest pain collapse, small pericardial effusion calling tamponade, you've got to go looking for is there a dissection flap? And the last thing I'd like to show is this idea that when we did the toe, so about 120 degrees plus or minus 10 or 20 or so in this esophageal view. You can see the aortic valve here. There's the left atrium at the top. Here's a little slither of pericardial fluid. What the heck is this? So we were very worried about this little area. And of course, you got to worry about whether you're dealing with an artifact or not. But again, this is where the importance of that clinical assessment along with toe makes you be really worried about something unusual sitting in the... Um, sitting in the ascending aorta. Because if we're thinking that this pericardial effusion came from something that's happening in the aorta, you've got to be thinking that there's a dissection flap. We had a horrible rip-roaring aortic regurgitation. I feel even more strongly that we're dealing with some kind of dissection flap that has just ruined this aortic valve somehow. And I'll just show you this series of pictures when I was wondering whether it was an artifact or not. I zoomed it in, I zoomed in, I tried it in lots of different angles. You can see I'm here at 104, I'm at 127. So different angles, different depths. I zoom, I use color, trying to figure out was this an artifact or not. I thought you had, it wasn't bleeding artifact coming over here. It looked like an entity unto itself. I can see it in all views. I felt really strongly this was a dissection flap. And luckily we drained about 20 mils of, 20, 30 mils of fluid out of the guy's pericardium and he stabilized. So we were able to get him down for a CT scan. They said there was no aortic dissection present. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That's not what it looked like to me on the toe. They did see there was an effusion, blah, blah, blah. There's some mediastinal lymphadenopathy from the cancer. And so I went down to the, went down to go and see the radiologist. And I took those pictures that I just showed you. And I said, listen, are you sure? Because this looks really dodgy. And um, it was really interesting. What the radiologist said is he, had, well, he said he did see something, but it was n it's not a gated study that we routinely do here when we're looking for these things, particularly in emergency scenarios when these guys have got quite fast heart rates. And he was looking at this, which he thought was a stitching artifact, which he described it as, which again is related to the fact that it's not, a, you see these kind of artifacts all the time when it's not a gated CT sc scan. But it was in exactly the same place that I saw that abnormality on the transesophageal. And you can get this idea here, when you go back and have a look at the aorta on the CT, that there is a linear defect that's sitting there about three or four centimeters up in the ascending aorta. And here on the 3D, I love a bit of 3D, it showed, it showed that flap as well sitting there, which is what I think we see on, uh, which is the dissection flap on subtle one on the toe. And so, Amendment was made, you know, further review of the ICT, and there was noted apparent filling defect located two centimeters distal to the sinus of Valsalva. So in the context of a non-gated study, this may represent motion artifact. So it, just again, a powerful moment for me of the importance of transesophageal echo in assessing these patients, but most importantly about clinical assessment. You know, it's clinical assessment that first of all made us think that this guy had a dissection. Toe helped confirm that. CT didn't initially, 
but then it's using you know decide you know using all the imaging that you've got and all the information together to try and make sure that you've got the best idea for the patient. Um, you know, this guy had severe AR. He had uh, an untreatable type A dissection on the basis of having pretty nasty cancer underneath there in his age. Um, he was stabilized, conservative management. We were able to get in some time with his family when we extubated him, and unfortunately he died a few days later. But um, it's a pretty nasty ending, I'm, I'm sorry about that. But you, you get the idea. I think it was a good case for me to learn the importance of being a clinician first and using, you know, it's worthwhile learning this stuff to try and figure out exactly what's going on. I think I've rattled on for about long enough. Um, if there's anyone left online, I don't know if there are any questions from anyone um, at all. Um, anyone online has got anything they want to ask? All right. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll just say thank you very much. I hope that was useful. A few tips and tricks with transesophageal echo, and I hope to see you another time. Thank you very much indeed. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching.